Well, good morning and welcome everyone to church. Welcome to Hope Crossing. We're so grateful to have you here this morning. Thank you for participating in some of the precautions we have to keep everybody healthy and safe and to feel respected. And we welcome those who are worshiping with us online today. If you are new here today, we want to encourage you to fill out one of our connection cards. Um, They're out in the foyer there, available for you. And then on the back side of the connection card is where we share prayer requests with one another as well. You can do that uh, with this Connect card here in person, or if you're watching online, you can go to hopecrossingcommunity.org, and there you can um, leave your connection information, share your prayer requests, catch up on previous sermons and sermon series, or in this Christmas Advent series, as well as find other resources that are available for you, especially for those who don't get to meet with us in person or who are watching with us and worshiping with us online and you're not in even our area. We encourage you to connect there with us during the week for your tithes, your offerings, your prayer requests, and to grab those other resources. And don't forget, back by the sound booth, we have those special Christmas Advent devotionals by uh, the, the Daily Bread that are still available for you to take and have and use. Um, and then there's also the regular Daily Bread that started the 1st of December. So if you didn't grab that copy, we want to encourage you to get those um, today. But I'm going to pray for us. We're going to sing a Christmas song and light the 4th Advent candle here this morning as we prepare our hearts today then for the Word of God. So would you stand with me and let's pray together. Lord, we thank you so much for today for the way in which you are at work in our lives in this moment. There are many things, Lord, that we could be doing uh, today that would be far from your heart and your truth for our lives. But in this moment, each one of us right where we are. So God, may the songs we sing help us to understand your truth and may they praise you. May our time together as a church family, this time of fellowship, Lord, may it bring you glory and honor. And may we, Lord, draw closer to you in this time and desire, Lord, more and more to follow you and your way for our lives. So speak to us this morning, Father God. Your church family is here to hear from you and to worship you. It is in your name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together. Let's sing this first Christmas song together, church.
soldiers of Satan and I know the reason the Savior is born It's Christmas Bells are ringing and I feel like shouting a seat. Today marks our fourth week of Advent, and our theme for the Advent candle today is love. Love is an overused and misunderstand, understood word. The same word here in America that we say we love uh, in and out with, we use with our best friend or the person we're most closest to. It's often a word that's been under scrutiny for centuries, trying to be defined by thinkers and poets and preachers and teachers as they dissect this word in all of its original forms. Yet with so much thought around it and the linguinga, li, li, <laughs> <laughs> trying to understand the language behind it and the texture and the context, it still is a difficult concept. And yet we often say that love is free. And yet love is hard. Receiving a love from someone can be difficult as well, especially if your past is filled with hurt or pain. Yet Christ at Christmas wants us to understand the deepness and the richness of his perfect love for our lives. So what is love according to the Bible? In one word, incarnation. When Jesus was born of a virgin Mary, God took on human flesh for the purpose of dying a final death for sin, to redeem humanity, the people he created in his image, to take on the grip and the consequences of sin and death and hell. This is love in its truest, highest, purest form. God loves the people he created so much that he sent his son, Jesus, to die so that we could live. And here today, we listen, we gather around this Advent wreath, and it's a message for you designed by God on this day for you to hear that He loves you. And His love for you is extravagant. Today marks the fourth week of Advent. It's a season recognized within the church around the world as this time to prepare our hearts for Christmas. And yes, on December 24th on Christmas Eve, we will gather here as a church family to, to bring together this entire preparation of season of Advent here as a church family at four. But today, as we uh, engage in some of the regular rhythms of singing the Christmas song and lighting the candles, we remember today the love. And this fourth candle is considered the candle of love to symbolize the love of Christ as demonstrated through his incarnation. His birth, his life, his death, and his resurrection. John 3, 16 and 17 says, For this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only Son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. God sent his Son into the world not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. And this began that first Christmas. Christ's mission of redemption is fulfilled through becoming a baby at Christmas. In the incarnation of Jesus Christ, the hope of Christ symbolized by the very first candle that we lit in Advent, it has transitioned now to the love of Christ symbolized by this last candle. Our hope is no longer some abstract concept, 
it is actualized and solidified through Christ and Christ alone. God's love becomes tangible because of Jesus. If you ever have been around a, a newborn baby, it's hard not to be filled with happiness and love. No surprise that Jesus came as a baby to introduce the most tender, most beautiful, and most powerful expression of love. But new life, new beginning. God's love becomes tangible because of Jesus. It's our job to respond to his love, to receive it. May you do so today in your hearts. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, thank you for the redemption and love we can experience through Christ alone. There is nothing we're going to ever be able to do to make you love us any more or any less. Your love is perfect. Your love is holy. Your love is good. Your love is just. Your love is pure. We surrender ourselves to you today. We ask, God, that you would do great things in our lives to transform our hearts and our minds and our lives to make us new and more like you each day. God, I thank you for your love. I thank you for your grace. Help us this day, God, to walk in obedience with you. By your Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. If you want, would you stand for one last Christmas song with us this morning? going to uh, pray and dismiss our kids to Hope Kids and their kids' church opportunity that they'll have now. At our church, we like to pray together and pray for them. So if you'd extend a hand over our students with me, we'll pray for them and send them on out. Father God, thank you so much for these students and this opportunity we have this day to be able to gather here and worship and that they have this opportunity, Lord, to be able to spend time together as a, as a young church family in your word and to learn your truth. Lord, use this time to grow in their hearts a desire to know you and to love you all the days of, of their life. Father, and we pray that you would use them in their homes and throughout their schools and their neighborhoods, even during this Christmas break, to share your extravagant love 
and your holy truth for the people that you've placed in their lives. Thank you, God, for this time they have to be equipped in your truth. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Kids, you are dismissed to go with Miss Lynn. She'll check you in back there, check your temperatures, and, and make sure you're all good to go. I want to remind you of a couple things here this morning uh, before we get into the Word, into our, our series, our sermon series for Advent. Um, we are collecting hats and gloves for those in our community. It's a simple way in which we can give back to our neighbors and in our community, and there's an actual need for it. Um, and so we want to encourage you to do that. You can bring those um, uh, next Sunday as well. We'll finish up next Sunday by doing that. There's also a collection basket in the breezeway of the north entrance of the church. That glass breezeway over there is open. The exterior doors are always open, so you can lay those there. Or if you're watching with us online, you can always have something. Uh, you can buy something online and have it shipped to us here at the church at 1505 Railroad Drive. Here in Carson, we already had some families do that, and it's been added to our collection. So thank you. Thank you for participating in that, whether it's a simple pack of gloves or a hat. We want to give them some new things and some cozy, warm things to keep them involved this year as well. And we do want to remind you that Christmas Eve, we're gathering at 4.30 here at Hope Crossing in Carson City or online at 4 o'clock. Sorry, not 4.30, 4 o'clock. Mark's heart just skipped a little beat. I saw that over there. He... Grabbed his chest kind of tight, and I was like, oh man. No, 4 p.m. on Christmas Eve here at the church for a special service as we reflect again around the, uh, the Advent candles and the Advent wreath and light the Christ candle together and then be able to get you home to your friends and your family or your virtual gatherings that you have to do uh, this year. So remember that, but remember we always take a special offering on Christmas Eve, and it's usually called the manger offering. And what we do in the Wesleyan movement was we collect gatherings for new church starts. Uh, and that's something that we traditionally do. But this year we're actually going to take that special manger offering and give it to several churches and a few families here in our neighborhood that have been struggling because of COVID. So we want to encourage you to prepare for that or to mark your special gifts that you send in for that Christmas Eve offering. So with that said, let's transition now um, into our time together in the Word. Um, here at Hope Crossing, we've been in a teaching series during this Advent series that we have been calling The Weary World Rejoices. The weariness of the world and the joy of Jesus is something we're kind of confronted with now at Christmas, but also in many seasons of life. Advent is a time in which we stop and remember the first coming of Jesus Christ when he came as a baby to a group of people at a specific time in a specific place. But we now, as disciples of Christ, as his church, as his bride, we anticipate. As Advent reminds us, as Advent reminds us deeply of our need for God, and not just of his birth, but of his victorious second coming, where all things will be made new. And all things will be made right when a weary world will finally and fully rejoice in his presence. Let's pray together here this morning. God, thank you for today and thank you for this chance we have this day to be able to gather around your holy word. We love you, God, and we are grateful for the way in which you are at work in our lives. Even now, as you've drawn us here to this time around your word. So speak to us right where we are. God, give us hearts that are open to your truth. And may we, Lord, respond in obedience to you this day, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. So during our Advent series here at Hope Crossing, we've been doing something kind of unique. We've been looking at a song, a Christmas song, each week and the story it tells and how it engages with Scripture. And today, together, we dive into the story behind that last song that we sang here together, God Rest You Merry Gentlemen. This is actually one of the most famous and theologically rich songs that have been written. For over 500 years, these classic lyrics and catchy tune have captivated our attention and perhaps been the nightmare of many musicians because Christmas songs are sometimes hard to play or sing. <laughs> but here are the lyrics just to remind you of what we sang a few moments ago. Don't worry, I'm not singing out loud for you. I'm going to read them. It says, God rest you, merry gentlemen, let nothing you dismay. Remember Christ our Savior was born on Christmas Day to save us all from Satan's power when we were gone astray. O tidings of comfort 
and joy. Think about that for a minute. Think about the remembrance that we can have as followers of Christ that Jesus was born to a specific time, to a specific group, to a specific people, so that we now would have his comfort, that we now would have his joy. That we now, when we're faced with temptation and deceit and lies from Satan, the enemy of your soul, that we would be able to stand fast and to remember that Christ loves us, that he's forgiven us, and that he set us free. What comfort that must bring, what joy that can bring. But it's also for the weary soul that has failed, that is broken, that is hurting, to remember once again there is a way out of your pit, and his name is Jesus. And that he brings comfort to our grief and our pain and our shame and our loss. And in that journey that he brings us to, there is great joy. A joy that isn't dependent on our actual circumstances, but it's a joy in being found in God. And the song says, so rest in this truth for your life. This really happened, it said. And it really does bring comfort and joy. Now this hymn, like I said, has been around for over 500 years. It was in Charles Dickens' 1843 story, A Christmas Carol. We're told in the first verse that Christ was born to save us from Satan's power. And what a powerful thought to remember this year at Christmas, but also in many seasons of our life. The Bible says in 1 John 3, verse 8, the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. All throughout the Bible, we read about Jesus doing just that, messing up Satan's plans. Every time he resisted temptation, every time he healed an illness or cast out a demon, or people responded to the truth that he shared with them, every time he made a mockery out of the devil. Of course, the ultimate example of this came when he went to the cross, where he devastated the devil's plans and and, and destined the devil to destruction ultimate destruction and his powerful display of triumph. Colossians 2 verses 3 through 15 tells us this, we were dead in our trespasses and in the uncircumcision of our flesh. God made you alive together with him, having forgiven us of all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and the authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. That is rest and good news. That is truth for your life. That is comfort. That is joy. And that is the love of God. And so during this fourth week of Advent, we'll focus on the mission that Jesus was on, his specific mission, a life-saving mission to save his people from their sins which means we have to take an honest approach about what sin is, don't we? We've all sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. So know that the ground is level here. There is no condemnation coming from this place to you, but only hope coming from God's word for you. All of us are in need of a Savior, and Jesus came to save his people. This was his mission, and this is a mission birthed in love, or the sacrifice would not have happened. Because the reality is, is too often we ignore the fact that we need a Savior. We think we can save ourselves. We think that if we muster up enough strength, that if we say no, that we can become disciplined enough and and be able to do the things we need to to make ourselves better. And in one sense, that's what we're trying to do this side of heaven. But there is nothing you'll be able to do to make you good enough. You will fail. You will have setbacks you will have to face that reality. Pride will keep you from that, even selfishness. And so in the meantime, we have to realize that we often try to forget the wrong we have done, that we all have sinned and fallen short. But the amazing thing about God the Father is that even knowing this, knowing the fight you would put up to admit that you're not perfect, He still sent his son, Jesus Christ, to take your sin and your shame so that you could walk in freedom. So that you could be in heaven with God forever. That's love. And so this final approach to Christmas is about fully realizing that Jesus, because of his love, we can experience real joy, real comfort, and real freedom. 
Forgiveness is a subject that impacts each of us. We all need forgiveness, and we all need to forgive. The subject can stir up a variety of emotions within us. Powerful, positive emotions when forgiveness, what? It leads to reconciliation and and restoration. But also powerful, negative emotions when forgiveness is withheld or when relationships are, are still broken. We have to remember first and foremost that forgiveness is an expression of God's love. And as forgiveness being an expression of God's love, our lives are meant to reflect our response to God's extravagant love and to his forgiveness. Our passage of scripture that we're going to look at today, Matthew 1, chapter, chapter 1, verses 18 through 25, combines both of these experiences for us in the story of Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. And as we look at this scripture verse, we must remember the gracious embodied gift of God's forgiveness in Jesus and what it has provided. It's important to reflect and to focus on forgiveness because each of us face times when we both need to seek forgiveness and when we need to offer forgiveness. But we won't do it the right way until we know the author of grace and forgiveness, Jesus. So if you have your Bibles, I want to encourage you to turn with me now to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 1. If you take your Bibles and kind of put your fingers towards the middle, you'll get to the very first Gospel of the New Testament a little bit quicker, all right? You can use BibleGateway.com, you can use your electronic device, whatever it is. I'm going to read, you're going to follow along, we're going to immerse our hearts in God's Word in a variety of ways. But Matthew chapter 1, 18 through 25 is our text for today, and I want to encourage you to listen and follow along with us as I read scripture for us today. Matthew 1, verse 18, it says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. And Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her, planned to send her away secretly. But... When he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Verse 22, now all of this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. And Joseph awoke from his sleep and did as an angel of the Lord commanded him and took Mary as his wife, but kept her a virgin until she gave birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. So a little bit of science here. The way you make babies isn't just when you shake hands with someone. So Mary hadn't done the handshaking part of the business yet. She was a virgin, and it fulfilled scripture saying she was a virgin and yet was going to conceive the Messiah, which makes it kind of a big deal because it's nothing short but miraculous. There has been no other thing in all of history that has happened like this. I remember one time I was talking about the story of Jesus when he walked on water at a a retreat I was at, and I was like, how many of you guys have ever seen somebody walk on water before? And this guy raised his hand, I did on Michigan, Lake Michigan in 73. I was like, whoa, that was weird. I wasn't expecting a response. And the same thing about the virgin birth. I've not had someone say, hey, because it only happened once. It happened according to scripture. It happened in this specific time. It happened as a work of God. A miraculous yet beautiful work of God. And in this series, we've unpacked that a little bit when we've talked more about the story of Mary. So if you've missed this Sunday, I want to encourage you to jump online at hopecrossingcommunity.org. Listen to some of these series because we've we've spent time kind of dealing with this miracle. And I don't want to get sidetracked from talking about the miracle of salvation today either. Because that's also what this story talks about. And so as we talk about the love of God, we need to be asking ourselves a very important question. And if you can't honestly ask yourself this question in your own heart right now, I doubt you'll be able to ask it among other people. So hopefully you're able to be honest with yourself and God. We need to ask ourselves a very important question. 
how does this gift of Jesus, how does it make us a forgiving people and a forgiven people? Here's the deal. Loving kindness blends judgment and empathy. Think about the language in which you use the context of forgiveness. Many times a response to an apology is accompanied with a, it's okay, not a big deal, don't worry about it. The intention we have is what? To accept the apology. However, words like that actually put a little bit of dismissal towards that action, towards the apology. Because if it's necessary for us to apologize, then there is something wrong to forgive. How important it is for you to hear the words, I forgive you, when you finally are ready to tell someone you're sorry. They mean so much. Forgiveness assumes that there was a wrong action and attitude to forgive. So yes, forgiveness is a kind of judgment, but it's not a condemnation. It's a blend of judgment and compassion. A counselor by the name of Steve uh, Sandage writes, Forgiving empathy or compassion is the capacity to become aware of the suffering and weakness of our offenders while still holding them responsible for moral wrongdoing. In the birth of Jesus Christ, we see where, where God blends judgment and empathy. The saving and forgiving act of God in Christ is not a dismissal of human sin. He takes sin seriously. Sin, the wrong things we think or say or do, it has a consequence. And the consequence for all people in all times, in all places, is that your sin will keep you separated from God. He cannot be in the presence of sin because he is a holy and perfect and able God, leaving us at a distance because of our sin. He provides a way for us to become forgiven through his son, Jesus Christ. The saving and forgiving act of God in Christ is not the dismissal of human sin. It's a declaration on human sin. That mankind must be forgiven and saved from our sin. That sin is real and there is a cost to it. Yet it is an action that does not leave people in their mess, in their sin. For it identifies with us in our weakness. We all have sinned. And most of us are fine with the idea when we apply sin towards others and their actions. Far too often we try to hide our sin with excuses or something that ends up then becoming a way in which or a means for us hiding from God, even from others. But we can't ignore the reality that when Jesus was born to the Virgin Mary, to Joseph that first Christmas, that it was an act of him coming to save us from our sins and to give us freedom. And we've talked about this before, but it's as if so many of us sit on the chair in our jail cell, knowing he has busted wide open the gate, and yet we still sit there trapped in jail. He's offered a way out. He's taking on the penalty for your sin. And yet you're locked away in your shame, your hurt, and your pain. Christmas is about remembering what Jesus has done through his death and his resurrection. It's about admitting that we have all sinned and we need a Savior. When you think about shame... Have you ever felt shame? Shame of something or someone? Have you ever felt the shame or embarrassment or maybe the regret of something you did? Perhaps it was a lie. Perhaps you you took on things, you looked at things, maybe images on the internet, or, or you participated in watching something that you know is opposite of God's heart for you. Maybe you cheated your way through something. Perhaps you've spread rumors about a person all because you were hurting or you were upset. Maybe it was easier for you to tell everyone else who hurt you or how they disappointed you. But you never would go to the person or the place that did that in the first place. 
See, we definitely don't like getting caught when we do something bad, and we often try to cover it up, perhaps by lying or denying that we ever did it. We may feel the guilt and the pressure and the heaviness and the conviction of that sin, and we just simply don't know how to handle it, so we stay quiet about it. We do everything we can to avoid the repercussions and the consequences of that. But the gift of Jesus that makes us forgiving people and forgiven people is a loving kindness that blends judgment and empathy because we have all sinned and only Jesus, only Jesus can save us. Look again at verse 18 here in our text of Matthew chapter 1. It says, Now the birth of Jesus came, Jesus Christ was as follows. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. See, loving kindness, it creates within us a vulnerability. And there is nothing more vulnerable than a baby, a helpless newborn baby. They literally cannot do anything for themselves. It's why I think even biblically we have to fight for the life of the unborn. Within the first 24 hours of a, of a child being conceived, the sperm meeting the egg, which is a one in a million shot, right? Life has begun. The heartbeat starts to go. Like they are defenseless and weak in the womb like none other. And we have to fight for that. We have to stand on God's truth and his promises and say that is life. Just like we have to once the child is born. In this most vulnerable state. A newborn is completely dependent on others for survival. In the saving, forgiving act of God in Christ, God took the form of a vulnerable baby. He didn't bust open the door and come back as this victorious emperor and king. No, he came as a vulnerable baby, yet he was still king of kings and lord of lords. So don't mistake the might of God and the vulnerability of a baby. In this act, God identifies with both the forgiver and the forgiven. First, God identifies with the forgiver, yet God does not simply identify with the forgiver. God is the forgiver. The vulnerability of God and the helpless baby Jesus helps us see what vulnerability can look like, the exposure, the insecurity we feel in forgiving others. In the Lord's Prayer, we're taught by Jesus to pray that God would forgive us even as we forgive others. They connect together. God does not ask us to experience something that he has not already experienced. Secondly, God identifies with the forgiven. He identifies with the forgiver, but he also identifies with the forgiven. Have you ever asked for forgiveness in a serious and painful situation where you were at fault? Not only does the forgiver you're seeking feel vulnerable and awkward, but it's also the one seeking forgiveness that can feel that way too. For when we admit our guilt, we render ourselves defenseless and vulnerable. In Jesus, God became defenseless and vulnerable as well. We often try to hide our sin by hiding from God and from others. The reality is that we cannot manage our own sin. If you can, I want to hear from you. Because I know historically it's impossible. No matter how hard we may try to avoid it, to cover it up, there's no way to avoid the consequences and the repercussions of the wrong things we say and do. It creates a barrier between us and others and God. And it destroys intimacy. Jesus came to save us from our sin, to take on our, our sin, and to take on our shame. So let me be very clear here. Joseph and Mary had not sinned. <laughs> Again, she was a virgin. They had not done the things that adults do to make babies. But she was yet pregnant. So Joseph and Mary did not sin by having Jesus. But there are some parallels to what Jesus does for us in our sin and shame in this story. For example, like Joseph was being obedient to God, stepping into a situation that would make him look like he had done something wrong, right? He took that on. Jesus was not afraid to take us as his. Meaning, he didn't divorce us quietly or write us off. He isn't afraid of our sin. Often you and I will run from grace because we feel unworthy. 
that God really can't love us or that he's not going to forgive us again. But that's not the case. That's actually what Satan, the deceiver of your soul, wants you to believe. So it's keeping you trapped in your jail. God loves us so much that he's willing to take all of our sin and our shame, take it upon him and forgive it and wipe it clean. The gift of Jesus that makes us forgiving people and forgiven people is a loving kindness that blends judgment and empathy, that creates a vulnerability where we are safe and no longer hide our sin by hiding from God and others. And that is forgiveness and that is true freedom and that is done in love for you and me. No one else in all of creation has been able to do this. Look again at verses 22 and 23 of Matthew chapter 1. Now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. See, loving forgiveness makes relationship possible. Have you ever tried to proceed in a friendship or a relationship this side of heaven with someone and not walk in forgiveness over your brokenness and or over your mistakes with them? Men, how easy is it to know your wrongs and to try to walk around the house with your wife and never admit that you're wrong or you've done something wrong? It's definitely not easy, is it? If they don't make you feel uneasy, you feel uneasy yourself, right? It's not until we stop and admit our wrong and try to make things right that we can start to build things back and to get things on the right way again. Because loving forgiveness makes relationship possible. This is what God intended when he offered his forgiveness. Relationship with you. A real relationship with you. God wanted to be with us and he came to be with us in Jesus Christ. Jesus is not some, uh, some simple act of God, but God himself with us. A theologian by the name of Greg Jones describes forgiveness this way. He says, forgiveness is not so much a word spoken, an action performed, or a feeling felt, as it is an embodied way of life in an ever-deepening friendship with the triune God and then with others. An ever-deepening partnership and friendship and relationship with the King of Kings, Lord of Lords, with the Creator and the Sustainer of life. God takes on flesh to embody forgiveness for us to be with us. But just as Joseph initially uh, intended to set Mary aside when this news that she was pregnant came, uh, came about, and the unborn child then with her, so we can also reject this relationship God offers. We can casually set it aside. We can try to separate ourselves from it in the quietness of night. Many today are rejecting Jesus just that way. Forgiveness does not create relationship. It only makes relationship possible, and knowing this should shape our own practices of forgiveness. Because Jesus came to save us from our sin and to give us freedom because of his love compelled by love, the lavish love of the Father poured out for you through his Son, his life and his death and his resurrection. This is love. And the ultimate act of great forgiveness and love, the perfect and holy God, blameless in all he has ever done, came and took on the guilt and sin of the world so that we or anyone who would believe in Jesus would have eternal life. This is what Christmas is about. That is is what true love is. The gift of Jesus that makes us forgiving people and forgiving people is a loving kindness that blends judgment and empathy. A loving kindness that creates vulnerability where we are safe to no longer hide our sin by hiding from God and others. A loving kindness that makes relationship possible for Jesus came to save us from our sins, to have relationship with us, to give us freedom. For us to know his love. Christmas is a wonderful reminder that we must be able to proclaim the freedom that we have because of Jesus. Because he has come to forgive us of our sins. Can you do this? Are you doing this?
The only way is by first receiving forgiveness from God. The message of forgiveness is not a general message, it's a specific message. Just as the person who came to save people from their sins had a specific name, Jesus, so does the one who receives God's forgiveness. His name is Nick, his name is Dave, his name is Sandy. Your name is Sandy, your name is Nick, it's written in the book of life. Specific names, but the question is, are you written there? Have you received forgiveness that Jesus offers? Forgiveness for your sins, every single one of them. Psalm 103, verses 1 through 5 says this, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget none of his benefits, who pardons all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with loving kindness and compassion, who satisfies you, your years with good things, so that your youth is renewed like the eagle. And verse 8, it says, The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in love. Verse 10, He has not dealt with us according to our own sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is the loving kindness towards those who fear Him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has He removed our transgressions from us. Just as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. The first thing is we have to receive forgiveness. Have you received God's forgiveness for your sins? Have you taken sin seriously and asked God to forgive you? Have you placed your faith and trust in him as your Lord and as your Savior? He is the only one that can forgive you fully and completely. The second thing we have to be able to understand is that we must then offer forgiveness. You and I must receive it from Christ, but we must offer it to others. Just as we are forgiven specifically, so are we to, sp to forgive specifically. We are to forgive specific things performed against us by specific people. Is there something that is still impacting your life? Some horrific audacious, nasty, vile thing that's happened to you? Name it. Forgive it. Is there a sin that needs to be forgiven? Who committed this against you? Who do you need to forgive? Sometimes you need to forgive yourself. But just as God and Christ forgave you, so must you forgive others, and yourself. This is not a call to be a doormat or to continue on to suffer abuse, but it's a call to walk in freedom. It's a call to say, my hurt and my pain will not live within me rent-free anymore. It is a call to walk in glorious freedom that only God can provide. When we forgive someone of the things, it doesn't necessarily mean there won't be repercussions for them and consequences of it. It doesn't mean you create unhealthy connections and boundaries and relationships again. It means you admit that that is powerless over you. Because the power of the healing one is upon you. Sometimes we have a hard time forgiving others because they've done some really horrific things. They've caused you and cost you much. And if we're not careful, it will create bitterness and it will destroy intimacy that we can even have with God. It will keep us from experiencing God's full power to release us from our own sin in one sense. In Matthew chapter 6, verses 14 through 15, Jesus calls us to forgive those who have hurt us. When we sin, we sin against Jesus, and yet Jesus came and forgave our sins. So it can be hard for us to forgive others, but it is through the power of Jesus that we are able to forgive and that we can walk in real freedom. The amazing thing about God is that he sent Jesus to take our sin and shame so that we could walk in freedom and through the love of Jesus, know real freedom. But it began at Christmas. This is the most beautiful, simple act of a baby who came to be God with us. 
for you and for me. What has God said to you this day, my friends? What has he made you aware of in this moment? How are you going to respond to this Christmas truth for your life today? Let's pray together. God, for some of us, we need to respond this morning to you by first admitting our need for you, by surrendering our life to you as our Lord and Savior. And right now, we want to pray about that. Help us, Father God, to confess our sin to you. We now, Lord, ask for your forgiveness of all of our sins. We ask you, Heavenly Father, to fill us anew with your presence. God, give us a desire every day to love you and to serve you. Thank you, God, for sending your son, Jesus, to die on the cross for our sins, for forgiving us, even in this moment, of all of our sin. Help us to desire to live with you and to walk with you every day, to pursue you and your truth above all else. Give us a deep desire in our hearts to turn away from the sin that had so easily entangled us and help us to run with great endurance this race you set before us, this time in which you have called us to live as your people, pointing others to the forgiveness and the hope and the love that is found in you. God, thank you for redeeming us. Thank you for sending your son to die on the cross for us. Thank you for providing a way out for our sin. May we be earnest. May we be sincere and repent. And may we purpose to follow you all the days of our life. We love you, Father God, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Before we close things out here this morning, Dave's going to come and share a few things with us about some prayer requests and, and things like that here this morning. Thank you, Pastor Nick. Oh, thank you, Lord Jesus, for your forgiveness and your love. Boy, do we need it. I know I do. Thank you, Jesus. Good morning, church. Good morning. If we haven't met yet, my name is Dave Faree, and I'm a member of the leadership team here at the church. And I want to thank you all, first off, for your your prayer requests, the way you've been putting them in so faithfully. We love praying with and for you guys. I want to ask you to please continue to do so because it is a privilege. And as we pray for you, please continue to pray for us. You can do that uh, anytime by uh, submitting a prayer request online at hopecrossingcommunity.org. Just click on that pray tab. If you're here in the house with us uh, this morning, there's a table right outside with a basket. You can put your a prayer request, and uh, your praise reports, because we want to know how the Lord is working in your life. So be sure to fill us in on your victories. We want to know that as well. And also while you're, uh, oh, no, as well, on the north entrance there, we've got a secure uh, deposit box where you can place your tithes, offerings, uh, requests for prayer, or praise reports out there in the north entrance anytime. Church uh, keeps that door open just for you in case you can't make it for service or any other time. You can stop by any time it's convenient. Drop off your uh, tithes and your prayer requests right there in the north entrance. And something else I wanted to tell you guys about this morning. Um, as most of you know, uh, we have a church partner here with uh, the Gideons Ministry. Now, you guys probably all know about the Gideons. You probably read their Bibles in the hotels, motels, and maybe even got a uh, a flyer from them or something on the street corner, but we partner with the Gideons to spread God's word and the message of his love. And the Gideons have set up a, uh, a display out here on this table in the uh, foyer here, and you can stop by, please, and take a look at that, if you would, and help the Gideons in any way you can as uh, the Lord leads you. It is a, a great ministry, and we are proud to have them on board with us, uh, just promoting the Lord's word and his love for others. It's important that we all know this. So stop by that table today and be a blessing to the ministry of uh, the Gideons, if you could, please. And now, would you please bow, bow your hearts with me and let's pray for our service this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your unparalleled love, Lord. We celebrate Christmas because of that love. In fact, the whole meaning of Christmas can be summed up in that one little four-letter word, love. You sent your gift of pure love to us that very first Christmas, Lord. He came robed not in gold, not in silk, but in the delicate skin of a newborn baby, our newborn baby Savior Jesus. The embodiment, the very embodiment of your immense love for us, destined to change the world and all of humanity forever, Lord. What an amazing love. 
This fourth week of Advent, Lord, help us to reflect on the magnitude of that love, that love that was made manifest in Jesus, our beloved Savior. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. It's in the name of our Savior, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Would you all please stand with me now? Let's sing a couple more songs to our Savior this morning.
church family verse of the week is found in Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 and 14. We want to encourage you all to memorize this verse and pray through this verse with your church family this week. Colossians 2, 13 and 14 says, You were dead because of your sins and because your sinful nature was not yet cut away. Then God made you alive with Christ, for he forgave all our sins. He canceled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. Amen.
It is by no mistake you have gathered here at this time and in this place and in this space to worship with your church family. Wherever you are in your journey with God, wherever you are this morning, know that God loves you. And his love was revealed through you, through Jesus, the birth of our Savior. And there is nothing you will ever be able to do that will be able to separate you from the love that is found in Jesus Christ. Nor height, nor depth, nor principality. As far as the east is from the west, God has removed those sins we have asked for forgiveness of. And he says, go now and sin no more. If you receive Christ today as your Savior, if you recommitted your life to him, we want to know, we want to pray with you, we want to encourage you. We've got things to help you in your journey so that you can grow in God's word and grow in him and his truth for you. But remember, if you believe in him, if you've sought his forgiveness, then he is enough. He is all that you need to accomplish his purpose for your life. He believes in you. He believes in you. Rest in his love, his perfect love for you this week. And we hope to hear from you guys and see you guys very, very soon. Everybody watching at home, we miss you.